Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Creative Exploration Series. Uh, today, we have Edmund McMillan, uh, who is uh, a game developer of some renown. <laughs> and um, I, uh, I'm actually super honored for you to be here, Edmund. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to uh, be a part of this series. No problem. Yeah, yeah. So for those who aren't aware of you, because I, I primarily talk about music and um, stuff like that, so some people might not be aware. Like, who are you, and where can we find some of the the stuff that you've made over the past you know, like decade or so? Mm, who am I? <laughs> the short I'm version. A... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just some guy that fell into making games in the early 2000s. Um, I started making interactive Flash stuff after doing comics for a few years in high school. Um, and, uh, fell into the independent scene, which was kind of starting at that mm -hmm. time. It was really, really small. Um, and I, uh, my first game, Gish, uh, my first game that I sold, I should say, um, that was my claim to fame at that point in time. Um, when the indie, indie scene was tiny, um, it won a lot of awards back then and there was no, I mean, that was back when like pop cap was making bejeweled and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like people viewed, <laughs> people viewed indie games as it's literally like back then it was pop cap. Um, there was a few top down shooters that were going around that were selling okay and there were no portals. So it was mm -hmm. like you sold off of your website for 1999 was the going rate of every indie game. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you if you were lucky, um, you know, IGN and whatever else, no one would write about your independent game. No one gave a shit about your game. But um, yeah. Penny Arcade might. And, oh, uh, yeah. Because they've been around. Got, yeah, they've been around for ages. And, like 1995, uh, I think. Yeah. We were lucky enough one day to get um, get a mention on, on their blog. And uh, we sold 98 copies that day. And that was a record-breaking <laughs> record number. It was insane. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that's when it started. And from then it was, um, I went through a period of just making a ton of Flash games. Um, no, but the most noteworthy would be like Meat Boy, mm -hmm. um, uh, Time Fuck, Ether, um, Triacnid, uh, Spewer, and a few other smaller ones. And uh, I kind of amassed a, a, um, a collection of games that I could kind of showcase to people. So in, in hopes I could. I could up my people. I'd hope that more people would get, I would get the attention of people who actually could give me more opportunities. And mm -hmm. that was around that time where, um, I think like 2006, 2007, there was a lot of like, you know, the Xbox live is, is coming and they they want indie games and this sort of mm -hmm. stuff. So it was, and then, um, you know, friends of mine that I had worked with in the past started releasing games like Tom Fulp released Alien Hominid and I'd worked with him in the past and he was a big, um, like he, he, he really pushed my stuff out there to the masses back on Newgrounds. Um, he's like the, the guy who made Newgrounds as well. Oh, yeah, and yeah. eventually Castle Crashers and, um, is associated with Battle Block Theater and a new game that's coming out soon. He's, he's old school. <laughs> but, uh, um, he's definitely people, got a style to his games too. I really like his style. Yeah. I like his style too. I mean, it, I, I, I like the throwback. I want to, I want to re remake games. I loved from when I was little yeah. um, w with my own, in, in my own interpretations, exactly what I do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I definitely learned, learned from him. Um, and it's, it's fun. It's fun to be able to like have the opportunity to even do something like that. But yeah, so I, I, I kind of like um, saw all these people who were becoming wealthy and there was actually because you couldn't make you couldn't make money off of your games like Gish was one of the best selling games of the early 2000s and um, me and Alex and Josiah, we split it three ways and we made enough to live for maybe one and a half, two years hmm. off of it and then it was gone Um and, uh, so there wasn't, there wasn't really a ton of money in it. Um, luckily we just had a small enough team with low enough budget. Um, and then Xbox live stuff happened. And then, um, I started to get the attention of a bunch of different, uh, publishers. Um, and I started to get contacted, um, for this anthology disc thing that I put out mm -hmm. of my old stuff. And, um, I started to get opportunities and, uh, uh, at the time I was working with Alex who, um, we were actually going to work on a, um, a new Gish or a remake of the original Gish for Xbox, but, um, the plan fell through and I, 
had to have some sort of backup. So I'm just like, okay. At the time, um, Tommy was working as a secondary programmer for Gish, um, for Xbox Live. Um, and uh, we're like, let's just do Meat Boy. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was the most popular um, Flash game that I had done at that point in time. Um, and uh, so we decided to do that. And that worked on that for two years. Um, and it was a scary, insane uh, process and that was recorded. Most people know me from any game, the yeah. movie, and that's what that's that the whole process was. I was going to mention um, that. Yeah. I mean, and you, you could definitely feel the fear through the screen on a lot of that too, where it's just like, you know, I've put so much of my life into this and now Xbox is screwing me over at the last, like last yard. And it's just like, <laughs> what is going on with my life? It was, um, it was a roller coaster. It's hard <laughs> to even remember. Cause it's so, I was so incredibly sleep deprived at that point in time. I can't, it's very, very foggy, which is kind of good because, you know, the residual trauma isn't as bad, you know, I don't, I don't wake up in fever sweats and stuff like that. So, and, and I learned from that too. It's like, I learned that, all right, I don't want to deal directly with, um, with publishers anymore. I'd rather deal with somebody else like as a middleman. And since mm-hmm. I've, I've started to work with Nicholas when it comes to dealing with large publishers, I'd rather have somebody else do the do the talking and do the dealing. They know what they're doing and um, they don't, you know, get screwed over as much as a, a small team of two people who are begging and pleading for opportunity do. I mean, yeah. we weren't, we, uh, we weren't in a position to barter with them. You know, we were at the whim mm-hmm. of whatever they wanted to do, but in the end it worked out. Um, and uh, a lot of people know me from Meat Boy. Uh, if mm-hmm. people see me on the street, they know me from the movie, obviously, because there's a face attached to it. But then, um, about a year after Meat Boy came out, I um, made this game called The Binding of Isaac, mm-hmm. which somehow <laughs> just blew Meat Boy out of the water when it came to the popularity of it, which is still insane. And because it's like Meat Boy really was safe um, content wise, it was weird. It still had my, you know, stamp on it. You know, you mm-hmm. could still see me through it and you could still see it echo from my other work. And But The Binding of Isaac was like purposefully abrasive. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was purposely it, it definitely inaccessible, is. like, and not, and not just content, but the way it played, like not many people realize now that like when that game came out, it did not, it wasn't well received. Like it really wasn't. It got okay reviews. It got, it got a seven. Um, it got some eights. Um, it, it, it was like, okay, you know, I made Meat Boy and now I made this weirdo game that <laughs> is just some sort of Zelda clone and nobody, nobody got it because it was. At that point in time, it was uh, maybe the original Game Maker version of Spelunky was the only game that compared to it. And yeah. those were under that's an, that was an underground game at that point. Like it had a huge following, but it was not mainstream. And um, and games like Dark Souls and stuff that actually punished you for doing poorly hadn't really been released yet. So it was it was a game that that was yeah. very punishing if you failed. But that that's not something that really became mainstream until much later. I remember having to try to explain that to people too and to be like, no, 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 it's okay if you die because it's just like I compared it to I wanted to make a game that was like D&D except it, all it was was making your character and leveling up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's all. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Because I remember really liking that. I, I remember really enjoying – the most the, the most fun I had playing D and D was always making my character, rolling the dice for the stats, and mm-hmm. then leveling up. And, and the progression, you know, yeah, yeah. Everything else was whatever. And it's like, what if you could make that randomly generated? And that's what it is. And the output's always different. And he looks different, and, and whatever else. And how do I encourage people to play play over and over again, and 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 try to get across to them that death is fine because next time might be really great. That that didn't come through. That didn't come through until the masses, until enough people who were diehards streamed it and were like, "This is why this game's fun." Yeah. Um. And and kind of showed it to more people and, and explained it. it. I really had to have like a narrator go, "Oh, this game. Oh, now I'm comboing with this. Oh, I died. Oh, it's okay. But I'm gonna restart again. And now it's a totally new floor." Like. Yeah. Yeah. It, and you unlocked something, so you're more powerful yeah. next time. And I I really like that iterative. Like that process of learning through iteration, I, I really love that in in games. Like I was playing Celeste a while ago, and um, I mean that, that definitely has some calls to Super Meat Boy, but I feel like it's more 
uh, input based. It's more like very precise input. And it's, it's all about learning, learning how to solve the puzzle and then doing yeah. it correctly. And it's just that whole iterative process of learning. I really, really love. It's fun. I mean, it makes you feel smart and it makes you feel <laughs> it does. I mean, and that's that's what games are about. Like a, a, a good game designer tries their best to make the player feel smart and yeah. feel accomplished and feel like they've done something very difficult. Um, and you do it in a way where it's not like you're not scaling a mountain right away. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, you, you, you ease into it and you do it with mutual respect. If that makes sense. <laughs> it's like you give them enough to not treat them like they're stupid and not treat them like they're not capable of doing something, but you always light the fire behind them and you keep them moving and you make them feel good about, you constantly make them feel good about what you're doing. If you don't ramp it correctly, mm -hmm. then, then it'll become empty at, at a certain point in time. Or they just quit and they're just they like, just this quit. isn't worth it. And yeah, which, absolutely. Which, which brings, which brings us to the next game that some people know before, which is the end is nigh. And, uh, <laughs> that's, um, that's a good example of pushing. Uh, it's like, it's like, a if meat boy was like a, a loving parent coaxing you along, um, then the end is nigh is like an abusive parent whipping you as you, as you progress. <laughs> but sometimes you need tough love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And to be honest, I didn't, I didn't play that one as much just because my life got busy, but I really enjoyed what I did play, but I like those types of games. So it's a, it's a, it's a stressful ball of insanity. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's one of my proudest moments. It really is like I, um, the end is nigh is as close to my magnum opus as it's going to be, which is funny because not as many people play it or play mm. it. Um, but it's the game, you know, I'm a hope, I hope I, w with each game, you know, I hope I look back and I'll be like, Oh, like, uh, it, this game's better than this game. This game's better than this mm -hmm. game. But w when it comes to the end is nigh, I've never had something go so smoothly development wise, and then look back at it and see, like, actually be more proud of what I did than be critical. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Like, more, yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm more proud of what I was able to accomplish with that game than um, almost any game that I've worked on. So that's saying something. But I know it's not for, I definitely know it's not for everybody. I, I mean, I went out of my way to make something uncomfortably abrasive and <laughs> punishingly difficult. I mean, I'm trying to simulate a panic attack, so it's not going to be the most comfortable thing in the world. But yeah, yeah. It's the most elegant panic attack you'll ever experience. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I, I really love it visually as well. Just like the, the very simple style, but it's still complex in ways that are readable. I guess that's the best way of putting that. I, I, I really do like the style of that game a lot. Thank you. I am also proud of that. I mean, I, I simplified it. I was trying to just because it's, it's, it came out of the woodwork as a, um, kind of like a weirdo prototype based off of an old prototype. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it was just like this little quick thing. And it was like, okay, well, let's just, just, just put something out. Like, I just want to put something out. Like I want to mm -hmm. finish it. And, you know, we put aside seven months of, you know, it's mostly part-time and then at the end, really full-time work. Um, yeah, I know how just, that goes. Should just snowball it out there. And, uh, yeah, it was, um, I'm, I'm, I got to talk about a lot of things and I got to, um, figure a lot of things out with what I was going <laughs> for there. So I'm, I'm super, super proud of it. Um, I just yeah. wish I could have advertised more. I wish I, w I thought I thought I'd just be able to put it out because I didn't feel comfortable talking about the game that much mm -hmm. back then, um, because it was a it was a difficult time in my life and I didn't feel like going into detail about the ins and outs of it. And uh, it took me a good year to finally feel like oh I can talk about this game, and um, but now it's like. I guess, I mean, we'll eventually release on um, PlayStation early next year, so I can probably yeah. do another round of, hey, I'm releasing this game again. <laughs> <laughs> I probably didn't play yeah. it, but it's Well, here. and that's, that's one of the problems that I had. Um, marketing sucks when you're a creative person. Yeah. Um, just because you don't like talking about your own stuff that way, where it's just like, hey, you should buy this. It's great. And it's just like, well... It's it's also an expression of myself, and I don't want to be like, oh well, I'm great, and you should. And yeah, I I had a very very hard time advertising my own stuff. It's difficult, but you have to do it. Like yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, like when I look back and I think about all the stupid effort that I put into putting myself out there in front of people, 
talking about my work as enthusiastically as possible Mm -hmm. and, you know, and just really like even for, for meat boy, I sent out zines. Like I sent out little mini zines with stickers and stuff like that. Um, just me and my wife put all this stuff together and sent it out to as many like, like snail mail physical things because I wanted people to see how much I cared about and how important this project was. Um, and then that, that actually, that was the first iteration of the comics. And then I eventually did a bunch of comics that we put out and, um, and, uh, I wiggled my way into, you know, packs and, uh, <laughs> GDC and be like, Hey, I got a bunch of comics. Like oh, it, they're going to be really good and we can just put them in bags for free and, you know, I'll pay for the cost of whatever. And we somehow got away with that a few times. Oh, nice. I don't think you can do that anymore. <laughs> but you at that you point, can. No, no one knew who we were, so it wasn't. Well, you can do it, but it costs money. It, it costs a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but at that point in time, we were just like, eh, well, uh, yeah, you probably don't know who I am, but uh, I got this comic and it's funny. You can check it out and I made it and we can print it. And we're like, we actually physically brought the boxes of comics to the places. Like it was, it was like, okay, sure. Stop <laughs> bothering me. But if you're doing this, you have to do it all yourself. Like you have to go and, and, and get all the shit and, and, and yeah. put it in the, put it in the bags and whatever else. So, uh, it was, a uh, it was some serious shit and you gotta, you gotta be able to do that in order to, in order for people to give a damn about what you're doing, because if you can't be enthusiastic about it, then you can't expect anybody else to be. Yeah, a lot of people that's... fake it. A lot of people fake it. I mean, I, I, I don't, I try to be as genuine as possible, which is bad uh, when I'm not feeling great. <laughs> <laughs> I can't put on a happy face and just go and, and talk about whatever, or if, if I'm not feeling what I'm working on, I'm not going to be able to be like really enthusiastic about it. Yeah, um, absolutely. But yeah, as long as you're genuine and I mean, you got to do it. You eventually get used to it. There was, there were, there were times in my life and my early career where the idea of like doing an interview was super stressful and mm -hmm. I'm at the point now where I don't care about anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> yeah. You, get, you, you just stopped caring. It all just, just melts. It's great. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's good though. I mean, I think that to, it's, it's less ego at that point and it's more just trying to talk about the things that you've learned along the way. And oh, yeah, I think that sure. that's, that's totally important. And, um, going back to what you were saying before, I think that it's also important for people to realize that you've been doing this for a long ass time. And I mean, people see binding of Isaac and how huge it is and super meat boy and how huge it is, but you've been doing, you were doing games for like what, like seven years before you even got to that point. Yeah. Yeah. About, about eight years. I mean, it depends on when you start yeah. counting what I was doing, but yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's something that I always like to look back at other artists. Like uh, I follow, um, YouTuber, uh, musicians like Andrew Wong and red means recording and some other really big artists. And when they do retrospectives, they go back like 10 or 15 years. Like, Oh, I started doing YouTube back in like 2003. And it's like, yeah, you're huge now, but it's, it takes all of that effort yeah. to get up to that point. It's such, a, such an illusion too. Cause I don't know any, I don't like, okay, great example, Celeste, right? So yeah. I've, I've known about, I've known Matt for a really long time. Um, and he was making games, I think before I was making games and he's a lot younger <laughs> than me. And like, yeah. so when, when I made Gish, I think I was, um, there is, there's this game called an untitled story or something. He made a ton of these like game maker type games, um, mostly platformers. There's one that I played called flail. Um, and then he did the jumper series and whatever else. Mm -hmm. And he, he was, he's really good. I mean, he's one of the best level designers out there. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, he uh, and then of course did Towerfall and everything else, and but oh, yeah. he didn't just fall out of the sky. Like oh, this guy's <laughs> yeah. been around for fucking ever. Um, and I and I remember he would just keep putting this stuff up for free. And I remember contacting him and be like, "Listen, like there's ways to get Flash sponsorships. If you make the transition to Flash, <laughs> um, you can get money for what you're doing." And um, uh, and then he ended up making um, a bunch of different Flash games. I think Give Up Robot and Money Seize were some of the bigger ones. Mm. Um, they were good. They were, they were legit, uh, platformers. Give up robot was pretty damn cool. It had a cool I'll have to look that one up. I, I think I've heard about it before, but I don't think I've played it. And this is all like mid, uh, mid to late. Oh yeah. Thousands. 
Um, yeah. And then it's the same thing with like Derek Yu and Jonathan Blow. You know, these these are all people that have been around. Jonathan Blow's been around since the 90s. So mm-hmm. it's like if you – the channel, if, if, some, if somebody's just blown up huge out of nowhere, there's a definite – trail that you can follow back for yeah. a good 10 years. It's almost scary. Yeah. Story. Yeah. And it's not just building that. Uh, it's not just building the knowledge of making something either. It's also building the connections and all of the other people that you know, and you make friends with along the way, because all of that helps like push you toward the the forefront of everybody else's mind when you release something. Oh, for I, sure. It's, it's, it, I hear so many people who are starting out as musicians who are just like, well, you know, I want to, I want to make it in two years. And I'm like, yeah. dude, that's, that's not going to work. You gotta, you gotta, it's a slow burn. And if you get fast too quickly, I think that that's even worse because that's just like a one hit wonder situation. You do one song yeah, and then you're done and you know, you don't want that either because that you're just going to be broke. <laughs> yeah. Art, art in general is such a, such a fine balance of things. It's like, if you if you got into games, music, whatever, and it was because you loved doing it, it's really hard to stay on track and mm-hmm. remember that that's the reason why you did it. Because you also have to make you have to you have to eat and you have to pay your rent. <laughs> so you have to you have to do the dance and you have to figure out how what kind of dance you're going to do that's not completely humiliating in front of everybody. You know, some, you have to make yeah. a compromise with yourself to figure out yeah. exactly what you're willing to do in order to sell what you need and for people to take you seriously. Um, it's shitty in that respect. It, it sucks when, <laughs> when business, <laughs> it sucks when business and art overlap that way. And, you know, with music, especially and with games, like, mm-hmm you have to be thinking somewhat about business the whole time, but it sucks yeah. because it has nothing to do with art. Like it doesn't have anything to do with art. And in fact, it's probably the worst thing you can be thinking about when you're making something that matters. Like some of my best, best work, like the perfect example, like Binding of Isaac and the end is nigh or two games that I make. Not, I wasn't trying to make money. Right. Yeah. And I didn't care about that. It was it was not about that at all. The Four Souls is actually another example of that. That was <laughs> the that fell out of the sky. It's like when I was approached, like quite honestly, and I okay, at this point I love Studio 71. Garima and Javon are great. I really loved working with them, but they are straight business people, hardcore mm-hmm. business people. And that's what they are good at, and that's what they do. But when I get approached by a business person, my first thought is fuck off. Like I have nothing, nothing to talk <laughs> with you. Like we are the opposite. We are the opposite people. Um, and they approached me and they were like, hey, like I uh, uh, we want to license the, the Isaac IP. And it's just like, Pfft. yeah, right. <laughs> oh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Great. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm going to do that. Um, and uh, they're like, oh, yeah, we want to we want to do we, we did this Kickstarter. And I'm like and then I started looking at the, the Kickstarter that they did joking hazard. Um, and that was oh, like, they did joking hazard. OK, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Jesus. I was like, OK, OK. Um, because I was gonna, I was gonna say that that Kickstarter campaign that you ran was one of the best run campaigns I've ever seen. Um, just from the amount of engagement that you pulled from people was mind boggling. Um, I, you, you got people that like get tattoos of your game, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they, they keep sending them to me. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 It's but pretty, it's pretty insane. Like, no, we had a lot of fun. Like it was like I said, like going in and this was um, a year prior to even thinking about it. It's like, hey, want to do this? No. And that was the end of it. But mm-hmm. the, they planted that seed and they 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 had me take them seriously enough because I knew that they worked on Joking Hazard and I knew that that game was good. And I knew that yeah. the Kickstarter functioned well. And it shipped and it was professionally printed and, and, and everything was legit because I owned it, you know. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, um, I think I do, too. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's a good game. Um, so it was like a year later, they kind of planted that seed there of like, I do have an opportunity and what should I do? And, you know, I was randomly moved to, I wanted to design something physical and I wanted to figure out how to, how to work with my wife on something because we work alongside each other and she's always been involved in the projects that I'm doing, but never so much in like the creative and testing and whatever else. So she's a big Binding of Isaac fan. That was one, one she's Mm -hmm. most most played like she played has she still plays it um but she played the beta and uh she was the first person you know definitely crossed the 100 100 hour mark 
um, <laughs> nice <laughs> uh, before the game even released. But yeah, uh, I wanted all this stuff to happen, and I and I um, definitely was still feeling that post uh, end is nigh. Like I'm tired of the industry. I'm tired oh. of of the biz part. I'm tired of. I'm just tired of the press. I'm tired. Everything. Every. I'm tired of developers. Like I'm tired of. The, the 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 song and dance that I see people doing and it's just so painful. It's like, how can I pander to an audience? It's like you I literally like people don't even know this, but look, behind the scenes, that's what people are talking about. How can I pander to an audience? You're making a fucking art piece. What are you doing? Like, yeah, <laughs> stop. Like, and and it's always the people that are already have money too. It's already it's the people. It's like you're already set. You're already comfortable, and everything's already okay for you you're set to take a risk now and you can do whatever you want. But it's like, how can I pander to an audience? Like, how can I make mm-hmm. more money? How can I maximize this and this and this? And that's what I was, you know, basically what I was talking about before. It's like, where's the, you got to compromise. There's a, there's a certain amount of thought that needs to go into selling your game because you don't want to fucking just screw the pooch and, and, and put all work, your work into something that's not going to make you any money back. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But you've got to draw the line somewhere and, you know, I look out there in the industry and I see so many people that I do respect doing very questionable things. And it's just, it seems like just a money hungry. It's like, so it's just desperation, I, I guess. I don't know. Well, but again, I can't, and, I can't, yeah. who, how can I, who, who's ha, ha, like, I'm in, a, I'm in a situation <laughs> where it's like my situation is different than other people and it's difficult for me to be so judgy, but it's still hard. It's still hard as an artist because sometimes I feel like I'm an alien. I feel like I don't fit in here at all. I feel like I'm, I'm just not part of this because I don't seem to have the same values as anybody else. And I just want to, I want to have fun and I want to be as genuine as possible while doing yeah. so. I want to have an experience. And like the four souls Kickstarter was the epitome of that. Like it was such like a rush of that month was insane. (laughs) I can imagine (laughs) it was non fucking stop. And it, the thing that really helped was I saw how seriously Javon and and Garima were taking it. They were flying out and like visiting me weekly. And like, it's like, Oh, well we're going to, we got to go to China to talk to It's like, what? It's like, all this is happening so fast and they're just going so fast. So it's like, okay, well I can do this. I'm a professional. I I can work my ass (laughs) off. Watch me. Um, but then I literally had the physical support of my, my wife and my friends when it came to testing in, in, and playing and it was it was never it didn't feel like labor it felt mm-hmm. like fun. it felt it, it would really like kind of brought me back in because you know i've been i've been working on bumbo for the past couple of years and mm-hmm. I, I don't know exactly what's going to be next um and at the time of working on four souls it was kind of like well once bumbo's out I don't know. Who knows? Like maybe I'll do something. Maybe I won't. You know, maybe I'll make comics again. I don't know. I don't. I want to. I want to get back into realizing what's what makes what was fun about this. You know, and I don't have that that spark. The spark isn't pushing in whatever direction. But then mm-hmm. after after four, four Souls, it was like I saw Bumbo even like I saw it differently, and I I like see i don't know it's it's hard to explain but i it made me feel like oh i know i know what i'm doing i know what i want to do um this makes more sense now and yeah I, it just I helped kind of just, shift your perspective yeah, yeah for sure and i kind of just turned the volume down on everything else if that makes sense yeah no absolutely i think that that shift in perspective is is really really valuable as an artist just to have a different different thing to focus on for a while. And then you can come back to something that you really, you know, another thing that you really care about. I think that that's, it's good to have more than one project going, even if they just take a little bit longer to complete. And that's how I've done it. I mean, I've, it's not to say that I haven't put down a lot of projects in the process, but Mm -hmm. it wasn't, it wasn't always my doing. I couldn't, can't take credit for canceling everything. Well, yeah, that's, (laughs) there's, there's uh, life always sucks sometimes. Like, Something always happens and, you know, you you just got to learn to live with that part too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So you you talk a lot about like keeping on task and scheduling your, your day to day. Like, how do you, how do you like manage your day to day process? Like, is there any particular way that you do that? Um, well, my life is very different now and 
one of the things that changed my perspective on everything and made me question the value of what I was doing is I, I have a daughter and she's three. And mm. at this point in time, she's a, a real little person. Like mm-hmm. for the, for the <laughs> first time, like I saw her as her own person for the first time since she was born when, um, I was going to the bathroom and she came in and she turned off the light and she does that often. She'll like go in and, and we tell her it's, it's sometimes it's dangerous to when we're in the kitchen and cooking dinner, you can't turn off the light because what if mommy gets burned or, yeah. you know, whatever else. <laughs> so she comes into the bathroom, she turns off the light and, um, I'm like, Oh, there's, there's a monster in here. Peach, you better turn it on. And then she doesn't care. She isn't, she's not scared about that sort of stuff. <laughs> and she's like, she's laughing to herself, whatever else. And I was like, Oh, whatever. So I, I flushed the toilet and I'm standing up and um, it's just pitch black. And then I'm like, oh, Peach, I'm I'm getting flushed down the toilet. And then I hear her just start freaking out. And she's just like oh, she starts no. screaming, no, daddy, no, no. Like like that, that was really happening. And you could hear her scrambling to turn the light back on, but she can barely reach it. And she doesn't know where she is. And I was like, oh, I felt fucking horrible. But it was that realization of like her perspective on life. Like she she knows I'm her dad. And she she realizes that there there is a possibility of me not being there. And it was just like such oh, a wow, profound yeah. ho- but horrible. Like I felt so horrible and I still feel horrible for even doing that. But it's like stuff like that that makes you be like, oh, so much stuff doesn't matter. <laughs> like, <laughs> so much doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Yet it's so hard to 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 realize that at all times, it's, it's so difficult. You're, everybody's constantly like, I'm at, I'm at war with myself at all times. And if I could keep that perspective forever, I think I'd be in a really comfortable spot where I wouldn't care. And I, and I, Mm -hmm. I'd be free to do whatever and whatever, but you know, you have got expectations and um, relevance and all the other bullshit that goes along with it. But, but yeah, I, I, my schedule is, um, like three or four days a week, I will come up here like I am today um, with my wife and we'll get a, a babysitter to watch Peach for a few hours while we work. Um, and I will work on – I will like physically work on uh, – do busy work when it comes to mm-hmm. Bumbo or you know card game stuff or updates and whatever else. Um, and then on when I have downtime between things, if I have an idea, I'll usually write stuff down in my phone or I have a sketchbook – you know, oh, next nice. to me at all times that I usually will draw stuff down and, and, um, kind of start planning future wise. But the, um, I've made a conscious decision to not take such a heavy workload. Like after the end is, yeah. that was, that was like the last really heavy workload I think I'm going to be taking for a while. And I think I'm more comfortable, especially after four souls with delegating work to people who are possibly much better illustrators than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so when it comes to that, like, I, I think I'll always do level design. I obviously will always do character design. I'll always, mm-hmm. you know, write the stories to my games and, and, and come up with the foundational mechanics and whatever else. But, um, I don't, I don't know. I could be totally wrong. I might end up just working myself to death next time too, but I'm, tr- <laughs> I'm trying to be as I'm trying <laughs> people. No, and I'm, I'm I learning think, and honest, I'm trying and I'm, and yeah. I, I want to be a good father and I, and I want to be, um, and I don't want to be an idiot who, who just wants to work himself to death, which I've, it's a mode that I've been in for a long time and I don't want to live I, like that. So. Yeah. Like my past two years have been like that. And I had an epiphany several months ago where it's just like, you know, I could, I could keep making YouTube videos and I could keep, you know, making music and all of this other stuff, or I could, you know, spend time with my wife and it's like, well, my wife is more important Yeah. as much as I love making things. And I absolutely do, but it's like, I do want to spend time with my family too. And it's just, it's not worth working myself to death, whether or not I become famous with what I do. Um, it's, it's not worth that. It's, it's so much more important to embrace, you know, the things that you have now, the ones that you love now. It's for sure. It's real important. Yeah. I was, I was thinking about that the other day. I was talking to, um, uh, a friend of mine who we were talking about the actual, this is gonna, <laughs> bear, bear with me. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> you know, the, the actual plight of women and she was, talking about sexism and, and, um, difficulty getting jobs places and stuff like that. Um, and then the thing that I was thinking about the most is like when it, when it comes to women, it's not necessarily like not an equal opportunity thing as much as it, 
that like the the thing that mothers do well isn't respected and isn't valued as much as mm-hmm. somebody making money. And it's it's just kind of a it's super fucked up. And that's yeah. that's that's it's not just a women thing, that's just how society works. We don't value the most important thing. Like child rearing is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. There's nothing more important than that. Like uh, it, yeah. it's, it's right there in front of you. And, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, scientific, you know, solving <laughs> cancer, you know, that's, that's yeah, there's point. always addendums to that. Of course, yes, but, yes. Of course. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like in the grand scheme of things, I'm talking yeah. about the day to day work, you know, would I, would I, um, rather, you know, make a million dollars or live semi comfortably and, and, and have a, a child that, that can go on to carry a legacy and, and have a future and whatever else, you know, uh, the future of, of humanity, like, you know, instilling yeah. values and that sort of stuff in this person and, and pushing them out. It's like, it's fucked. I, that's what I think. That's where I really think the, uh, the issue when it comes to women and, and value in this day and age and, you know, what people are talking about, I really do feel like that it falls on the fact that people don't respect what, what women- well, the amount of time invested in that? Yes, it, and and the value in in the value that that's that's placed on that isn't isn't accurate. Yeah. the amount of time. The, that, the, the really fucked up thing is even even with the movement now as is, it's um, I'd say other women are getting on other women saying like you, what you're doing as a mother, just being a mother doesn't have value. You still have to work, and you you should have a career, and you should have this and this and this, <laughs> and it's like it's so screwed up that just overall we're just devaluing this so much. And yeah, it's, and it sucks that I still have it in me. Like I still have it in me to be like, I lose sight of what matters, even though I know it matters and I know the value of it. And when I'm in it and I'm, you know, with peach and I'm interacting with her and whatever else, um, I get lost in a night and I don't not thinking about other stuff, but then, Mm-hmm. you know, the moment I start working again and I start thinking about work, <laughs> you know, you just get <laughs> swept back up in. You, it's so, it, it, it's, it, it, and I, and I really feel for, I mean, guys like you, like YouTube, YouTube type personalities and, and <laughs> Twitch streamers. Like I, I've in the past done a, a few, like when I've been on the round table podcast and stuff like that, it's like, mm-hmm. I usually just end up talking to these guys a lot before and after, of how do you do this? Like this is, it seems like the most competitively grueling and just abusive thing to do to yourself. (laughs) Yeah. These things, because it's so, it seems just so difficult. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it sucks how it's like things are becoming more like that. Like, everything, everything is, is, is uh, yeah, I mean, game more. development has becoming like that. Music's been like that for a long time. Um, it, I think it's just more the fact that there's so many people out there that are able to do this now. Like the technology is so accessible to make a game or it's so accessible to just record a video and post it on YouTube. There's just so much competition out there now that it's near impossible to make a name for yourself without being absolutely ridiculous. And, yeah. you know, it, it, when it comes to, and I hate to say integrity because some people want to do that, but when it comes to art, like artistic integrity, like people don't always want to be an ass on, on a, on video just to, just to get a couple likes, yeah. you know, it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's, it's, almost, it's almost scary when you think about it. It's, it's very similar to if there's not a gatekeeper there that's saying like, no, we're, we're only going to publish by this rule set or whatever else. And that the mm-hmm. wall comes down and everybody just jumps in and does whatever it does start just boiling itself down in nothing. Mm-hmm. Like the, the, the free market will turn into <laughs> li- people literally eating shit for views and, <laughs> and you know, a, a matter of months. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's, it's weird. I mean, I like to think as an artist that stuff, is always cycling, you know, and you'll, you'll even with like video games and stuff, um, you know, people have been saying that the indie boom is over and it is, you know, it's, it's so clogged. Um, it's so muddied. It's Mm -hmm. so difficult. Um, 
But just kind of like the music industry, when the music industry destroyed itself because it wouldn't go digital, um, you, it, it, what it, what it usually does is it weeds out the people that aren't serious about the art, you know, and you get a bunch of people who are doing it because they can't not do it because this is who they are. And from that, you have the potential to make something amazing. You, you have a potential to form a new artist out there who is purely in it because they love it. And that person yeah. might probably have, you know, the, the next Michael Jackson or something, you know, the, yeah, it, the, the possibility is there when the, mm -hmm. the playing field has been leveled. Um, of course, when it comes to like pop music, it's still, it's all over the place. It's, it's <laughs> that's, yeah, pop. that's, yeah. But I'm talking about non pop. Um, yeah. You know, there, there's still always the chance of, 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 uh, some sort of viral sensation coming out and, and, and being legit. Um, mm -hmm. and I guess one of the, one of the benefits of having the, the playing field leveled like that, especially because of the cost of making things is so much lower is that it allows people to do it because of their passion, yeah. like you said, and it allows more, more genuine artists to shine through rather than people who are just doing it to try to make a buck. Yeah. Like, you know, how asset flips were so popular on steam while well, they still are, but like three or four years ago, that was all that was released on steam was just asset flips because it was easy to do when it cost a hundred bucks and you know, why, not, why the hell not? Because you'd make a couple hundred off of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I have, I have faith. <laughs> I'm a big pessimist, but I do. I, I my foundation still says, you know, it, this, this sort of, this sort of, um, chaotic chaos. I mean, it's what it is like, mm -hmm. yeah, this sort of chaos will sometimes spawn amazing things. And it's always mm -hmm. the things that can't be quantified. It's always the things that can't be copied or predicted. Like you, you, you don't know what's going to be the next big thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, it could be something really cool and genuine. Yeah. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Probably well, not, but you know, yeah. Let's talk about failure then, mm. because I think that that's a very important part of any creative process. For sure. Um, and like, I, I guess one of the things that I'd like to ask first is like, what are the, what's one of the main reasons you think people fail when they start making games? Uh, the main reason people fail when they start making games is because they bite off more than they can chew. Yep. Okay. That's that makes the sense. Number, that is the reason. <laughs> and um, I was guilty of that many times. Um, I, I, the first game that I started was with Tom Fulp. It was called Serious Shy, and it had very ambitious – basically, it was going to be Meat Boy. Like um, that was my my first iteration. It was going to mm -hmm. be a platformer um, with minor combat and a um, bunch of crazy bosses and it's going to be all Flash and whatever else. And mm -hmm. um, worked on it with Tom for a little while and then um, – he had to stop working on it because he was working on this thing called alien hominid and it was going to come out on console and it was like, Oh shit, mm. I got some serious business. So it was at that point in time where I was like, okay, I need to look at other options. And that's when I got a job, um, with chronic logic making gish. But, um, mm. yeah, like I, I have failed constantly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to, you, you have to fail to learn. Exactly. And I was just going to say that it's like, I, 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 there's like no shame in failing. It's, it's, it's the only way, or it's, at least it's the best way to learn because then you realize what you did wrong. Yeah. And it's not to say even, even your biggest successes could have major failures inside them. Like, mm -hmm. like, um, like I really, I really like the character design to the bosses in, in, in Super Meat Boy, but a major failure on my end was at the very end, we were so rushed that I had to just come up with bosses and it's like, Oh, come up with bosses and cutscenes, and we've got to do this and it's got to be good. And blah. but it was tacked on. It wasn't actually needed. Um, I probably could have got away with removing those bosses and had a actually better game. Um, if removing <laughs> them. Um, I mean, and that's kind of what I did when I worked on the end is night. I took bosses out because it didn't seem to make mm -hmm. sense in the grand scheme of things. There's an appropriate place for bosses. And yeah, when you're working with pl a platformer that is as pure as you can make it, um, you know, maybe that wasn't a good choice. And, uh, you know, you, you have to learn from your mistakes and you have to be as critical for me. I mean, I'm really critical about my work and I, mm -hmm. I know realistically 
the shortcomings and that where I did something good and, you know, I may not be shared with everybody, but, um, you got to stay open to that sort of stuff in order to get better. Yeah, definitely. I, um, I, I, I completely understand where you're coming from with that as well. Just, just trying to find the, the pieces that didn't work for you, even if they worked for other people, it's like you personally, you have to find the ones that didn't work for you and then just iterate on that process and learn from it rather than just being like, well, that sucks. I'm never going to do that again. Yeah. Um, well that, that actually kind of already answered my next question, where it's like, what was the kind of the mistakes that you made as you were growing? But, uh, I think you already kind of talked about that one. <laughs> there, no one knows about, I mean, not everybody knows about all the games yeah. that I've had to put down for whatever reasons. Like mm-hmm. I've, I me, mean, Genix is the one that's most known. Um, that wasn't really in my control. I could, I, I would still be working on it if it was my, if I was complete control over what was going on with that. But I may get back to that in the future. And I kind of like that I, the iteration that I, of Mugenics that I was working on back then when I was with Team Meat, um, uh, I'm glad that the stuff that I'm, I'm playing with now is, is a lot cooler when it, when it comes to, um, there's more to do and it's less of a base sim. Um, Mm -hmm. so I'm happy that in the end that it didn't come out, um, when it came out because I know I can make a better version of it in the future, but that was, you know, that was a, a failure. Like that was, that was like, Oh, we like, it was not going to work. Um, I have to put it down. And, um, there's been games that I've worked on for years that haven't seen the light of day. And that many people even know about, it. I worked on Gish two for like a year and a half. <laughs> I worked on Triacnid two for a while. Um, worked on the sequel to time fuck or a Burroughs for what, like six or seven months. Um, hmm. And, you know, there's countless games that I've prototyped and, and, uh, for whatever reason, just wasn't feeling it. But usually you learn from those too. You know, you, you pick little pieces that, that, you know, worked and then you move on. Yeah. When, when it comes to sequels, I actually just made me think about this when it comes to sequels, like what do you feel like deserves a sequel? Because with like Binding of Isaac, when you, when you, uh, basically just updated it from the flash version, yeah. that wasn't necessarily a sequel as much as just kind of like a, it was a remake. A, yeah. Yeah. A remake. Thank you. Um, so like what deserves a sequel then in your eyes, like more mechanics or just a different, uh, continuation of the story? Like if, so I, there's a lot of games not necessarily I'd like to make sequels to, but I'd like to re-envision in some way. Like I'd like to do a hmm. full version of ether. I think that would be really cool to explore that. Um, and I would like to do a sequel to the binding of Isaac one day, namely because hmm. I view the binding of Isaac as inherently flawed. Um, and mm-hmm. there's so many aspect of it, aspects of it that I'm not, I, I don't, I know that I could do better. And there are a lot of, <laughs> there are a lot of mechanics that can't be added because of how everything works. Um, the item interactions, I'm guessing. No, no, not, really? not so much okay. that. I mean, it, it's such a balancing act too. And I'm, this yeah. is something that I've been like working on on paper for, for quite a while. And I want to make a better version of the binding of Isaac, but it might be a worse version in other people's eyes because of what people expect and what people like about the game. So it's going to be when that, when I cross that bridge, it's going to be interesting (laughs) because it's, it sucks to have to be at that point where it's like, I have to make the decision myself to either make game that I really want to make and not think about the fans or what expectations are at all or make Mm -hmm. the compromise. And that's, Kind of yeah, I, and that goes that goes back to what we were talking about, yeah. where it's like, where do you draw that line between the the artistic integrity and what you actually want to do, and just finding a way to find that middle ground? Yeah, but when it comes to sequel, what warrants a sequel? I really do think it's, I mean, it's up to whoever's working on it, hmm. and um, that makes sense. If if you feel like you can do something that's doing that's not just doing the same thing, mm-hmm. like you have to add a considerable amount more. Like I could could just keep doing DLCs for days, but I mean, it's, it's a little, (laughs) it's a little crowded. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it really is. I, I just, uh, I know. Yeah. I've basically been holding DLCs for a sequel because it would mean make, making like revamping the game in so many different ways. And I, I can't talk about it because I can't talk. I can't spoil things if, no, no, absolutely not. But yeah, no, I, I, there's a lot. I love the game and uh, I love watching my wife play the game and I would love <laughs> and I like playing the game myself and I would love to be able to um, 
perfect it. Um, and mm-hmm. however I view perfection being <laughs> exactly. And yeah, I mean, have the, the definitive edition of the game rather than, you know, what, what was released and the director's cut or whatever you want to call it, where it's just like, this was your vision. Yeah. And if other people don't like it, that's, you know, that's okay. That's, it's okay not to like something. I mean, that's something else some people need to learn. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's like, this was your vision and you want to get it out there. And I think that that's really valuable just to, to be able to do that. Um, because in the end, the art is yours until it's released. For sure. So I know you've got a lot of considerable success from all of this stuff. And, and I don't know if you've ever really feel like you made it anywhere. I mean, aside from financial stability, this is always a question I love to ask. It's like, where, what, what's, uh, somebody's uh, goal for success or what somebody like defines how they define success. I, I mean, for me, I've just always defined success as um, how proud I am of whatever I'm working on when it finally comes out. I like that. Um, yeah. Like I'm I know people say this, but I'm really being honest. Like I don't give a shit about what people think about the game. I really care about what I think about the game. And that's what matters. Like mm-hmm. if I if I release something and I know it's not that good, that's going to be difficult. Mm. Yeah. You know, but. Luckily, I've been able to be proud of most of the things that I'm working on. And um, I try to be positive because I could be very negative when it comes to myself um, and critical. Um, <laughs> it's very easy to be yeah. that way. <laughs> um, so I try I try to not so focus on the negative and just try to see the wins. You know, like what did I do right? Mm. What was successful about that? And, and um, you know, be proud of, of that. And that I think is success. I don't I, – I, I've enjoyed um, – uh, the movie was helpful in – me meeting, you know, strangely enough, musicians that I respected over the years. Like I got to meet Mike, Mike Patton. I got to meet the Melvins and um, oh, nice. the, the the band Isis um, uh, and uh, Palms and, you know, a bunch of like – it was weird. And it's all just stemmed from the fact that like their uh, Ipecac Records, uh, one of the guys there is a fan of mine and uh, he's a big nerd. So – he likes, he likes <laughs> what I'm putting out and, and, uh, oh, that's awesome. and so, so that was really cool. And that, that made me, it wasn't like it made me feel important because these people don't fucking know who I am. They don't care. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like <laughs> they, there's no crossover at all. Like I, I think the, you know, the thing that usually inspires me the most when it comes to just being an artist is music. And, um, I can never share that with a musician that I respect because there's no way that that musician respects me or understands what I'm doing. <laughs> It's just not, yeah, that's fair. It's not going to happen. And it's, 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 um, but I can still just be a little fanboy kid and be like, oh, yeah, you know, I got backstage and I get to meet these people that inspired me. And that was really cool. And so that's like oh, definitely yeah. a perk of success. Um, you know, being financially comfortable and being able to take bigger risks as an artist is also really, um, uh, you know, a major perk of success. But when it comes to just success in general, I, I, I view it as if, if I'm proud of what I, what I, what I put out. Yeah. And as much as I hate the, the, the idea of, you know, it takes, it takes money to make money. It's, it's one of those things that I've found, um, really valuable over time. Like I've been saving money from my creative endeavors to put directly into my creative endeavors yeah. lately. And it's, it's made a world of difference over the past year, just being able to be like, you know what? I think I can afford doing this, even if it's stupid. And even if it's like a hundred bucks or whatever, just being able to do that is honestly really liberating. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's a really cool feeling to be able to buy something that you made or that with money that you made through your creative pursuits. And, um, yeah, it's, that's really, really cool. And yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's all about, um, it's all about just loving what you put out and being honest. And I I've said honest a lot because a lot of the people I've talked with lately have been like, you just have to be honest with your work. You have to be really genuine with your creative pursuits. Well, that's what and, art is like yeah. art. I, art is honesty. I, I, I firmly believe that. I firmly, firmly believe that that's what, that's what makes art art. And, you know, and that's like kind of what I was saying where when it comes to games and stuff like that, when it comes to business, it's the opposite of honesty and business is lies. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's lies. And they're, yeah. they're, they're, you know, it's whatever, you know, it's, we're not, I'm not the moral police here, but like, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's manipulative. 
And um, there's the, that duality, you know, when it comes to, to selling your work. Uh, and you have to, there's the dark side and the light side. And mm-hmm. you got to, you're, everybody is a, a bit of both. So you got to be able to tread, tread the line. Yeah. yeah. You just don't go too far. And it's the truth. Like you go too far on the artistic side and everybody, every fucking person in the world is going to take advantage of you and you're going to be nothing and you're going to float off. You're probably end up killing yourself. Um, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the extreme on that side. And then the other side is this super fucking greedy person who throws his life away to just make a buck and never experiences life. Yeah. You know, and you've got to go somewhere in the middle. <laughs> yeah. And being, and being aware of like kind of where you're at is also really important there. Just having, having some kind of cognizance of, you know, maybe I should focus more on my art for a little while and, and stop trying to, you know, flood Twitter with my self promotion and yeah. all this other stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So I sometimes agree. I just stop looking. And I think I think my <laughs> I think my Twitter followers have gotten used to it over the years. But there's periods of time where um, I like interacting with people, and I like mm-hmm. I like especially now it's like I'm just interacting with people when it comes to Four Souls questions, and I want them to play right. And I want to also yeah. I'm also gaining it's like intel. Like I'm g- give me information of exactly what you don't understand, <laughs> so I can refine the instructions and make it easier for other people. And um, so it's the interaction is good, but it's like. After a while, it just is like, ah, I don't want to look at my phone anymore. Like, I don't want to, I want to yeah. do anything but because it just pulls you away from what you're there to do. Well, and I kind of like the way you do it where it's just like, I got 15 minutes to ask me any question you yeah. want. And I, I think that that's a really good way to do it where when you have like that much of a following just to be like, I can open the floodgates for like 20 minutes, go. Yeah. And then you, you're just done. And um, yeah, I like that too. It's in it, in it, it's fun. And you know, if people are there, they get some information and usually can squelch any of the, I started doing that way back in the day when there were weird conspiracy theories, when it came to the binding of Isaac about how I was this like crooked, um, liar. <laughs> <laughs> it was like <laughs> scamming people. And I don't know what I was gaining. I don't think I it. heard oh, this. Oh yeah. It's like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, it was that rumor that came out that like I, um, the, the reason why the launch of afterbirth was, was buggy was because I was getting back at people who like hacked the game. Oh, yeah. It all like stemmed. From, <laughs> I do yeah, remember it all stemmed that from a Kotaku article that I guess got enough like traction for people to believe and it's totally oh insane. God. It doesn't even make any sense. Like, why would I do that? Like, that doesn't make sense. I'm a, So what I want to do is piss off the people who paid money for the game because of some other people that did something else that have nothing to do with this. this is yeah. So yeah. Place. It's. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of that. And that, that's what spawned this whole idea of like whenever whenever something goes wrong and it's sometimes a bug, like whenever something's buggy or or whatever else, um, it's it's that I'm like cutting cutting and running and i'm a scam artist there's a, and then it there's a lot there's a lot of trick down for like even like the kickstarter right now like um and i know some people are just being dicks to be dicks but i don't oh, i hate yeah, that, yeah. that if people are actually confused <laughs> i don't i don't want people to think that like it's it's hard right now for people to understand that like forty thousand large boxes have been being shipped for the past two weeks um, mm-hmm. for multiple locations. So then not only do they have to get shipped from a major location to another and then split to two different locations, those also have to be packed with specific articles, you know, of whatever, and those have to be shipped and they can't all go out at once. And I think most people understand that. Yeah. Anybody who, who's participated in a Kickstarter before should understand. And that. it turns out that the buddy of Isaac Kickstarter had an abnormally high number of new to Kickstarter Oh yeah. So yeah. there was, there's a lot of that. Um, and it's yeah. like, I want people to understand that we're shipping it out, but they're like, why haven't I gotten it yet? And then there's people that are like, well, you know, you said that, um, we'd get the game by the end of November. And I was like, no, we said we'd complete it and it would be mm-hmm. shipped out by the end of November. We, and then it's like, well, then you're arguing over that. Then I'm a, I'm a scammer and I'm a liar. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, dude, look around. I've, I've kickstarted so many things that never came out. It's like, yeah. <laughs> like we, we actually did it like, and, it, and it's difficult. So it's like, you want to be proud of that accomplishment. Like they killed it when it came to actually releasing on time. And the, the hoops that I had to jump through in order to get stuff tuned 
and to my liking, um, in time to to actually release in November was insane. Um, and we did it. And then it's like, well, because of the holiday rush and because of the amount of orders that we have, um, you're not getting your copy until December. And now I want you dead. <laughs> well, and it's not like a it's not like a game where there's a day one patch and you can fix anything that you messed yeah, up on. That was a, it's, it's, it's like it's printed. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> yeah, it's once it's printed, it's there. You're not going to like re- release an addendum rule book being like, OK, well, this card is actually plus four instead of plus yeah. three. So just keep that in mind. Luckily, like there's only I think there's only one card where the way it's worded and most people still do it correctly, but the way that it's worded doesn't actually work mechanically with how things work in the game that it's like, I see it and I'm like, ah, ah, (laughs) I did not word that right. How could I have missed? Nobody said anything about it. And it's like, oh, it's because people understand how mechanics work and they, it's whatever. But that was stressful. Yeah. Well, I can't imagine you're running like a 15 year long con on everybody just to (laughs) do a successful Kickstarter. I've I've talked about it too. And I've been like, why do you like, just give me, give me a general idea of like, why do you guys, and not everybody, of course, but why do the the conspiracy theory people, why do they go towards that? Like, why do they want to assume that I'm um, this wicked liar? Um, and people point out the (laughs) fact that like, we're at a time where business is so terrible and people like big business video game wise, they do a lot of scamming and they do a lot of taking advantage of Mm -hmm. people and trying to, you know, get people to do shit that they don't want to do. And, you know, they do it either way. Um, uh, that that's, so that's the kind of consensus is people just assume everybody's terrible. terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, whatever. So, but that's the reason. So the reason why I do those AMAs is to make sure that people know I'm not a completely terrible person. <laughs> that makes sense. And I, I like that. I mean, that's, that's how we got, we got connected during one of those, uh, yeah. just to ask if I could do this. And I really appreciate you taking the time well, I, I to, uh, remember your icon for quite a while. I've, I've seen that icon oh, I've, many times. <laughs> I, I bug you a lot. Um, like I said, you were one of the inspirations on uh, on the game that I made and put out uh, last year. So I, uh, I'm really, really happy that I was able to talk to you about some of this stuff. No problem. I, I think I I think I still have one of your tweets. Like you saw a GIF of my game and was just like, "That looks crazy hard." And I'm I'm using that uh, as a quote <laughs> on my Steam page. Good. Because I didn't have a whole lot of quotes because like uh, like we were talking about before, like delegating is really hard. And I did not delegate any marketing department for my, you know, single de- developer game. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, you know, that's got to be honest. It's, it's a crapshoot now when it comes to that sort of stuff, oh, too. It's like if really you're is. if you're releasing on Steam, you're releasing with 30 other people. And those 30 other people oh. are also trying to do the legwork. It's it's rough. Like, I don't know. I don't know how you, I don't know how people can do it like you. I mean, re- realistically, well, yeah. I'm just trying to trying to think like the the past really successful indie games that that come to mind are all from developers who are established in in the mid 2000s, um, mm-hmm. who've been around for a while. And I'm trying to think of anything else. It's usually like a kickstarted thing where it's like like a like a Cuphead or Hollow Knight sort of like yeah hand drawn, you know, some, some 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 sort of catchy thing that's on top of a game that plays and performs well. Um, yeah, like a viral, a viral type thing, like a five nights at Freddy's let's play type environment. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's, where it's good with streamers or whatever, where you get, you get that repeat value or you get all that emotional, emotional response from it. So people like want to watch it. Like it's, it sounds awful, but it's like, like any art form, if you want to, it's going to take eight to 10 years for you to be taken seriously. And sometimes (laughs) it really is like just like sticking it out. Like there was yeah many, 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 many developers that I, you know, grew up with, even when things were tightly knit and just a handful of people that just fell off the face of the earth. And I thought that they mm. were going to be there around forever. You know, they seem to be really good at what they're doing, but they just faded off into nothing. Um, and you'd be surprised at how many people who are just like, if you keep doing what you're doing, even if you're not amazing at it yet, and you stand the test of time, you gather people, you get attention mm-hmm. over, over, over the years, you um, you grow up with other peers who, who eventually get opportunities, who extend their hand to you, you know, like it's, it's all eventual, but you have to be, you have to look for that kind of opportunity and you have to be logical about it. Um, you, yeah. I mean, obviously like 
you can't just throw in the towel. Well, and that goes back to time management as well, where you can't work 100% of the time and burn out and then you won't get anywhere because you have to put the time in sure. and you can't rush the process. My, my number one thing when I'm when talking to like I've gone up to uh, UCSC and stuff because it's local and there's they have a game design mm-hmm. um, uh, major and uh, I've gone up there and talked to uh, the kids a few times and it's like the thing that I always tell them is if you – if you're if you want to get a job in the industry and you just want to work for a company, that's great. Then you can totally do that. But if you want to be independent, mm-hmm. um, you better your goal better better me better just be being happy, because you're not yeah. going to ever get the things that you want. The chances are slim to none. <laughs> like, in order if if you don't gain a great deal of happiness from what you're doing, and I always say like if you're not doing it now, like if you're like, yeah, okay, I'm 20 years old. And I want to be an independent developer in the future. No, you're mm-hmm. not. You're not. <laughs> Spoiler alert, you're not. Because if you're not already doing that now well, or before you're, you went to college to go and learn whatever else. Yeah. If you weren't already doing something that was independently art driven, you know, by yourself, self-motivated, it is not going to happen. Just work for a company. Yeah. There's no, there's nothing wrong about it at all. Being independent is really fucking hard. It's really fucking depressing. It's really, really, really <laughs> isolating and it is not for everybody. It is not, yeah. um, I, and it's sad because I would have said this in the movie. I probably did, but it's not a good thing to put in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, but that's what I want. I like, I want people to have a realistic idea of what this is. Like, this is a life decision. Your mm-hmm. whole, my whole fucking life I've sacrificed so much to be this, you know, obsessedly, stupidly driven person. And I've, I've, you know, it's very mind blowing to me that I have a wife. I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> like it's you, you have to be selfish. You have to be mm-hmm. self-motivated and you have to sacrifice sleep. Um, you, it's, it's just unhealthy mentally and physically like you're going to eat shit and you're not going to sleep <laughs> and, and you're and you're going to be worrying constantly and whatever else. Um, but I didn't have a choice. <laughs> and that's, that's usually if that echoes with you, then you're stuck and you're here. And yeah, you, you gotta yeah, do you gotta this do. is, this sounds way too real, man. <laughs> <laughs> but th- that's what it is. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, this is, there are some people who are built a certain way and, and those people have a hard time. I'm talking mostly about myself. I'm not saying that you're like this too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, uh, I get it. People like me have a hard time being happy. Um, it takes extra work. And mm-hmm. I personally, in order to stay happy, need to put in that extra time, the extra amount of labor. And I need to be able to do what I want to do or I'm going to just crash and burn. And that is what's gotten me here. It's this flaw. It's this flaw that I have, <laughs> the character flaw that I have that makes it so I'm not getting enough <clears throat> serotonin from the, what people usually do. Like I'm not a person that can just be happy, you know, you know, working at a, at a, a company where I'm not doing what exactly what I want to do. And it's like I knew that at a young age and I knew that in order for me to have a future where I'm not, you know, killing myself and other people <laughs> – I needed, (laughs) I needed to be able to be independent and I needed to do that. And I don't care if I was poor doing it because that didn't matter Mm -hmm. to me. Like I know exactly. I I grew up poor. I can be poor. I know how to do, I know how to work it. You know, that's fine. (laughs) But that, that was the goal. The goal was never where I got to. The goal was I want to, I want to continue to do whatever I want to do and hopefully make enough money to live. Um, because that's, what's going to make me happy. And if I'm not doing that, I'm not going to be happy. So there's no other choice. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm trying to remember the quote and I can't remember what the quote is, but, uh, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. Yeah. Um, that's like, that's like the best thing I can think of when it comes to starting as an artist, like you should have started 20 years ago or 10 years ago or whatever. But if you haven't yet, you need to start right now yeah, because sure. if you want to, if you want to be an artist, you gotta, you gotta put the time in the, the biggest, here's, here's my secret. This is the, the closest <laughs> thing to my, the, a secret as possible as, as it comes to me, just not saying, you know, work until you die. But 
kind of goes hand in hand with that though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, there was a point in time where I got fired from, um, I was an animal control officer and I got fired from that job and I was, it was horrible. I was totally mm-hmm. betrayed by the people that I worked with. I lost all oh. faith in everything. And you know, in the future I, that would happen multiple times and I'd lose faith in humanity forever, yeah. you know, but <laughs> at that point in time, it was just like, I felt so low. I didn't want to go back to working at GameStop. I did end up going working back at GameStop mm-hmm. for a little while, but I didn't want to have to, that did, I didn't want that to be what I was, was doing. And I didn't want to have to just become a manager there in order to, to pay rent. And it was like, what do I need to do? Like, what do I need to do? And, um, Danielle was reading this book. I think it was called a diary of a teenage girl. Um, it was mm-hmm. a graphic novel about an artist's life growing up. And there's a part in the book where she's reading a book or somebody told her this and it's like, write this down on a piece of paper and the piece of paper, you, you always see it. And it says, do at least one thing today to get you to where you want to be. And mm. it seemed like such a profoundly simple thing because it's so easily doable. And then from then on, that's all I did. Every single day I would do something, even no matter how little it was, in order to further my chances of being an independent artist. And if it was, yeah. if it wasn't emailing people, if it wasn't to talking, talking people do it business wise, it was drawing, it was practicing, it was learning, but always have that in my head of like, okay, in order to achieve this goal, and I know eventually I'll hopefully get there, you know, 10 years from now, maybe I'll be able to do this, but it's like, that's what I did. And you would be surprised at how quickly something like that will snowball once you start just being mindful of doing it, you know, mm-hmm. me being mindful of getting better at whatever it is you want to do and learning about understanding under, at least understanding the business, at least understanding the financial aspect, at least understanding, you know, the networking aspect, just learning everything you can about what it is that you want to do in every way. Um, you, you get there. <laughs> yeah, do. Absolutely. Like it's, it's, it's not something that happens overnight. I know we're way over time, so we can, we can wrap up, <laughs> but Edmund, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. I, I think that a lot of this is incredibly valuable to people, including myself. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that we were able to get some time today to talk about this and no problem. Um, yeah. I, I yeah. appreciate the questions. Yeah. Do you have, aside from Twitter, which I can, I can post in the video description. Do you have any, anything else you want to shout out? Uh, no, I mean, legend of Bumbo coming out early next year. Um, uh, I'm working on an expansion for the card game and, uh, the card game should be available for pre-order, um, within the next week. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I guess, uh, I guess we're good then. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time again today. I really appreciate it. No problem. Yeah. You have a good one, man. All right. See ya.